All right. Hi, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started today. No and a few more will join us as we get going here, but welcome to Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action Health and Virginia's Changing Climate. Uh, this is a fourth um, in our 2020 webinar series, and we're very um, happy to to speak on occupational heat exposure today and have a couple of um, great panelists who we'll introduce you to in uh, just momentarily. Um, just a couple of housekeeping announcements. Um, we'll be taking questions today throughout the webinar. You can submit them at any point during the presentation. Um, we won't uh, open them up and uh, we'll have our official Q&A portion be after both presentations. Um, but the Q&A box uh, should be on your screen uh, in the kind of the middle of the, the bottom part of the menu there. Um, and you can type questions at, at any point throughout and we will get to those at the end of today's presentation, which will run no more than an hour. Um, uh, first up, we have, uh, uh, we'll have Dr. Julia Golke, who will give um, our presentation on occupational heat exposure, and then Virginia Clinicians uh, for Climate Action Steering Committee member um, and Advocacy uh, Committee co-chair Bob Kitchen will also talk about some of the legislative developments that, uh, that are upcoming on this issue. Uh, but with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Samantha Adut, uh, chair and co-founder of Vene Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action to introduce our speakers. Okay. There we go. Thank you all for joining VCCA for the fourth in our webinar series, Health in Virginia's Changing Climate. Today we have two outstanding presenters who will inform us about a population of growing concern, outdoor workers. As summer heat waves have intensified and lengthened, in Virginia and across the world, many of us are protected by air conditioning. Being in an air conditioned environment has been remarkably successful in protecting people from extreme heat. It prevents uh, about an estimated 75% of heat related mortality in the United States since 1960. But not everyone can spend their summers in air conditioning. Some people cannot afford the energy required to protect themselves and their family with air conditioning. Our children, we hope, are physically active in the summer months, playing outside and not confined to their homes uh, on video games. And some people have no choice but to be working outside, regardless of conditions. And this includes those who do the essential work of harvesting the crops that feed us, building the infrastructure that keeps us moving, repairing our hospitals and our homes to keep us safe, and yet these outdoor workers currently have no legal protection from the rising heat. So today we'll learn more about this vulnerable population and how we can enact both national and state level policies to protect outdoor workers from heat illness in our changing climate. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Julia Golke, uh, to begin today's presentation. All right, thank you very much for um, a wonderful introduction. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak today. And um, what I'll describe today are, are really uh, a set of studies that we've done in Alabama. And so you might ask, uh, why is she presenting <laughs> in a Virginia forum? Well, um, one reason uh, is shown here. And if you look at this most recent uh, climate analog mapping, it indicates that climate, for example, in Roanoke, Virginia, will be most like Tuscaloosa, Alabama in about 60 years. Uh, so if you want to, um, this is a really great app to try out uh, if you haven't already. Uh, you can put, punch in a city and um, uh, figure out in 60 years what the closest city in the U.S. is like. Also, Alabama is great to look at occupational as well as uh, just population um, health and how heat uh, affects it because of uh, the heat index there and the wet bulb globe temperature threshold that is commonly exceeded. Also, it's an extreme weather prone region. So as mentioned, air conditioning is of course a very important adaptation strategy um, that we've been using. However, when power outages happen, then that is no longer uh, available. 
uh, and that typically will happen during extreme weather events. Also, there's minimal state and local government climate change adaptation planning. So it's important to kind of understand that the overlay um, that that um, has uh, on the effect. And then when we think about vulnerability, uh, we definitely have those populations represented, both urban rural vulnerabilities, as well as uh, a different uh, sociodemographic uh, factors that have been associated with vulnerability to uh, heat related illnesses. So one of the first things that we did um, in Alabama is look at heat-related uh, illness incidents. And in fact, in 2012, um, it was a reportable uh, to the health department disease. It was made reportable just for that year um, by the Alabama Department of Public Health. And this is actually showing heat-related illness rates per 100K population. And um, if you don't know Alabama too well, uh, the city, Birmingham, which is the largest city in Alabama, is in Jefferson County, which is here. Uh, Montgomery about here and then Mobile down here. So what we noticed um, very quickly was that a lot of the higher rates were in uh, the very rural parts of Alabama. And one of the things that we were concerned about was, well, could occupations uh, potentially explain this? So we looked at the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, uh, percentages of occupations and then used metabolic equivalents uh, to rate um, the kind of the intensity, uh, the physical intensity of the work with a particular task or with a particular occupation. And then plotted that um, uh, over Alabama and noticed, of course, some similarities um, when, when looking at this. So um, since then, there have been several studies that have looked at outdoor workers, um, in particular agricultural workers, in lots of different states and have noted that rural uh, areas um, may be most affected by heat-related illnesses, particularly when outdoor worker populations are increased in rural areas. So what we wanted to do is actually look at differences between urban and rural uh, heat exposure uh, prospectively. And in particular, we focused on a, a, an urban situation in Alabama, in Birmingham, uh, and worked with Friends of West End to recruit in majority minority uh, zip codes within um, Alabama uh, outdoor workers as well as residents and then rural um, uh, residents as well in West Central Alabama uh, uh, working with the West Central Alabama Community Health Improvement League. So how do we measure personal exposure? Well essentially what we did is we asked people to um, wear an eye button uh, which measures temperature uh, on their shoe for about seven days and um, we recruited again uh, from Birmingham and uh, West Central Alabama, and then also placed um, temperature uh, measures and looked at temperature in neighborhoods uh, that uh, people were living and working. And then of course, we wanted to compare uh, to a standard weather station measurement. So all in all, we recruited uh, 54 workers and then also um, residents in each location. This is just giving you a close-up of how um, the eye button is attached to the shoe. I always get the question about why the shoe. We actually tried a lot of different places on the body, like a lanyard around the neck or a bracelet. Um, and essentially um, with partners, uh, first of all, we got body heat measurements with the lanyard um, that of course we didn't necessarily want, as well as with the wrist. The shoe seemed to be of the most protective of kind of getting that body heat measurement or, or reducing that effect. And then also, um, you know, we wanted something that somebody was definitely going to be wearing outdoors most of the time. And of course, we had all participants um, uh, 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 wearing um, um, shoes during the, the full seven days. Of course, when they're in bed at night, we asked them to set this at their uh, bedside table um, uh, um, to, to really get that full range of temperatures experienced. So as I mentioned, we deployed neighborhood sensors as well, and this is just showing a diagram of that. Uh, we had a radiation shield and we uh, posted these. Sometimes you can see here on a signpost, a lot of times on trees. Um, we of course noted the, the shade um, uh, and proximity and also the ground cover on this um, uh, neighborhood placement. All in all, we placed 43 neighborhood sensors around and then ultimately, of course, we took those personal measurements, um, the, the thermometers on the shoe, and we matched them to the closest neighborhood sensors 
as well as the closest weather station centers. We wanted to really get an idea of how well neighborhood sensors and then of course the weather station sensors, how well did they actually predict those personal exposures um, that were being experienced um, by both residents and outdoor workers. So in order to do that, uh, in particular for the outdoor workers, we wanted to use this, the, the gold standard for looking at um, heat stress, which is wet bulb globe temperature. Now wet bulb globe temperature doesn't just take air temperature into account. It actually, of course, in incorporates humidity as well as wind speed and then solar radiation. So we needed to supplement our personal exposure uh, measures with these other temperature measures from the nearest, or not temperature, sorry, other wet bulb globe um, uh, measures uh, to get at our um, estimated personal wet bulb globe temperature um, and then compare it to the weather station value. The other thing that we needed to understand, as I had mentioned before, um, the internal heat generated um, also, of course, contributes to heat-related illnesses. So it's not just the ambient em environment that you're exposed to, but how much work your body is doing um, that in generates uh, internal heat. So a standard way of doing that is taking activities and giving it a, a, a metabolic rate here, and then assigning per hour, based on a, a, an hourly activity log, what the overall um, uh, threshold limit value is. And so again, when you look at this uh, graphic, um, and this is kind of a standard way of looking at it for an occupational exposure, you have the metabolic heat generated internally, you have the environmental ambient temperature, and then you want to see if that will cross this line into an unsafe category. If you cross this threshold limit value, then you start to think about, okay, what work rest schedule is needed to protect against um, heat related illnesses. And that, so that's essentially what we did with our measurements. And so what you're seeing here um, as some of the results of that study is comparing um, the, the person work hours above the TLV um, using the personal measures, again, from the shoe versus the wet bulb globe temperature just from the nearest weather station. And what we see from this comparison is that um, during the working hours, and I actually forgot to mention, so these outdoor workers work from 6 a.m. until 2 p.m. Um, that's standard for, so these are um, Birmingham Public Works employees um, that uh, maintain parks, et cetera, in Birmingham. And so this is their standard work time. And what you see is that, um, again, uh, compared to just using the closest weather station, these personal measurements suggested being above um, the TLV a little bit more. And what you see on the um, right-hand side is that when we translate that into a work rest schedule, so how much per hour should be rest versus work, uh, again, we uh, it suggests that um, the personal exposure uh, is, is suggesting a higher number of hours in the most rest schedule. So, um, this one would be again 75, so 45 minutes of rest versus 15 minutes um, of work in this most um, uh, extreme case. So another thing that we wanted to look at, um, because of course not in a lot of occupations are you gonna have your workers wearing personal um, uh, thermometers throughout the day. Um, and of course, one of the standard ways um, of measure in, in high risk industries of, of measuring uh, potential risk is using um, a heat meter. And so one, uh, a wet bulb globe temperature meter, one um, that we use to compare our metrics with um, is the Kestrel wet bulb globe temperature meter. We had two, these are quite expensive um, uh, uh, um, systems. And so we had two of those and we wanted to compare that kind of occupational gold standard to what we got with the kind of the low cost um, I button sensors as well as remotely sensed or satellite derived data sets. So what you're looking at here um, is the National Land um, Data Assimilation System. So this takes, it's a NASA product that takes a lot of weather station data as well as some other um, remotely sensed data to get an estimate of uh, temperature and humidity and a lot of other weather parameters. So we can use that as a standardized approach to get a grid of estimates and then compare what you're seeing here are the I buttons that we placed in West Central Alabama and then Birmingham. And then we can compare 
um, what we get again with our kind of neighborhood buttons uh, uh, versus, uh, again, this gold standard of the Kestrel. And what we found when we did that was that the I buttons really did reduce um, uh, error and bias associated with just using either weather station or the satellite or remotely sense derived product. Um, and again, it's a low cost sensor and would improve our ability to, um, to detect that, uh, those temperatures that we may, um, that may be in, uh, increased risk associated with that. And this is essentially showing that um, specific uh, diagram or estimated uh, work rest schedule, um, just assuming a moderate workload, uh, and what the differences you would see by by including the I button data. Again, a little bit more uh, um, uh, hours in a um, more um, uh, rest cycle. So now I want to just move over to how we compared uh, a heat index with the, you know, we have, so we have workers and, our, and then we also have um, residents. And so what we did here is we just looked at hourly heat index calculation. So just taking humidity um, as well as uh, the, either the nearest neighborhood temperature, the nearest weather station temperature, and of course the participant thermometer. And what I wanted to show here is that, um, what we see here, so these are uh, as labeled, rural, urban, and then outdoor workers. And then we're looking at the diurnal pattern, essentially, okay, across the seven, you know, combined across the seven days of participation, um, looking at max temperature versus mean temperature. And what we notice, of course, is the outdoor workers, as expected, reached much higher max temperatures than what was recorded at the nearest weather station or neighborhood uh, during those work hours from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. And we also noticed that the, the outdoor workers match much more closely to weather station and neighborhood uh, uh, temperatures than our urban and rural residents. More than likely, again, um, definitely reflecting the time spent outdoors, of course. So a lot of time is spent, of course, indoors and climate controlled settings. Another interesting thing is nighttime exposure. So um, we, uh, what was mentioned was, you know, air conditioning, um, uh, although it may be in the house, is not necessarily used because of cost. And in fact, we did notice um, through additional surveying that uh, a lot of times air conditioning is minimized, the use is, is minimized uh, for definitely in our rural populations. Also, when we just look across, we noticed that um, Certainly when we look at our, our personal exposure estimates, um, we're reporting a higher number of person hours in the unsafe category. These are the National Weather Service categories of heat index. Um, a lot of what, uh, you know, um, early warning systems, for example, heat wave alerts are, are based on. And also we, we noticed that both the neighborhood as well as the weather station I, um, heat indices were underestimating the hours in the extreme danger category across these three groups. And of course, you notice, as expected um, from what I've just previously presented, the, uh, the danger and extreme danger categories are, are um, higher um, in the outdoor workers than, than the respective residents in either urban or rural uh, locations. Just a, of note, of course, is the urban residents are more comparable to the urban outdoor workers. They live in the same city in Birmingham. Um, so really, this is the, the best comparison there. So certainly this study is not the only study that has been done. And in fact, recently there have been a lot of studies that have been uh, uh, looking at personal exposure in outdoor workers. And um, of note, uh, a couple in um, a closer place in North Carolina um, have been published. And so I wanted to just um, put that forward too as additional resources. Uh, if you're interested in this kind of, again, prospective analysis, of, of heat exposure and, um, and how to measure that and, and where it falls when you compare it to weather station data. Um, and so this is just a diagram from um, one of those papers, uh, this one here, that looks at, at um, Appalachian State University outdoor workers and looks at um, their, their kind of daily um, uh, patterns of temperature exposure compared to the weather station here in black. All right, so now I just wanna switch a little bit to the, the possibility and, and the value of using satellite-derived data sets. 
because um, I think it also is very important for looking at occupational exposure and a retrospective analysis. So of course we need perspective um, uh, measures uh, to, to track exposure and to protect against heat related illness, but also to better understand um, what uh, factors uh, are associated with, with um, heat related illnesses using prior data um, it's important to kind of uh, be able to use um, some exposure metrics there. And so I had mentioned the North American Land Data Assimilation System, phase two, as a really nice product to kind of standardize across um, urban and rural areas and incorporating both weather station data as well as remotely sensed data. And we had previously looked at both mortality as well as preterm birth in Alabama. And one of the things that really is of note, and uh, probably a, you know, a lot of the audience knows here, that it's very hard actually, <laughs> there's a lot of definitions of a heat wave. So one of the first things that we did is we wanted to ask the question, okay, based on this retrospective analysis in Alabama, because we know also geographically it, it, you know, that, that definition will probably change, um, what is the best definition? And so these are basically just 16 different uh, definitions of a, a heat wave that have been published previously. Um, these you may recognize as the National Weather Service uh, heat uh, index, those danger categories that we had um, just looked at. And what of, what's of note here is that these are relative measures up on top. So it's a percentile based uh, measure and it's based on the, the climate of, the, of the, um, uh, the location that you're in. When this data is actually uh, the national, uh, the NLDAS uh, data is, is taken back to, it goes back to 1979. And when you go from 1979 to 2015, you can essentially analyze based on any one of these definitions, the increase in heat waves geographically across the United States. And this analysis essentially, um, what we showed is that um, heat waves in the Southeast are, have really been increasing about two times the rate of heat waves in, in the Northeast, for example. And you can see, again, uh, based on these, uh, this, these coloring, so the, the graph bar here is the number of um, uh, additional heat waves. And so you can see that, again, these are, are looking like Southeast, much higher increase, at least over this period from 1979 to 2015. So one of the things that we found in Alabama when we applied the birth and death records was that this relative mean daily temperature um, was uh, more associated with the, the adverse health outcomes, both increased preterm birth as well as um, non-accidental deaths. And you, you can see again here, this graphic just shows how different um, the prediction of a heat wave is when you go across these different um, definitions of a heat wave. So again, the relative mean daily temperature, which is actually a quite easy one uh, to measure, um, is, was the most predictive in, in the case of Alabama. And in fact, previous studies also um, that have looked across the United States have suggested that this, again, this relative um, percentile based um, definition works quite well. So one of the other things that of course we're concerned about are those microclimates. And using satellite-derived data sets, uh, again, great for standardization across urban rural areas. So this is NLDAS, which I've shown to you before, and this is um, looking at essentially just temperature. But what you notice is that um, urban heat islands are not necessarily picked up here. The resolution is not uh, fine enough to pick up uh, particularly smaller cities. Al or like Atlanta um, is definitely picked up in, at, with NLDAS, but not necessarily the smaller cities. So one thing that we actually did do was we downscaled the NLDAS data using land surface temperature from MODIS. And here you'll see that these urban heat islands really do um, are picked up quite nicely in this case. So this is another kind of potential application. Here I'm just showing the, this application for defining a yes, no, whether there's a heat wave or not. And again, you can see very clearly that with using NLDAS alone, Mobile and uh, Montgomery is not picked up, whereas uh, they are picked up with the downscale data um, as being in a heat wave um, on this particular day. So overall, I just want to say that basically um, these types of, of measures are um, important and have what I think are implications for improving um, our ability to adapt. So really compared to weather station data alone, which of course a lot of our alerts are based on, uh, these low cost sensors um, placed within neighborhoods may improve um, our evaluation of heat health risks 
both occupationally as well as in uh, residential uh, environments. And then I also would suggest that uh, remotely sensed data can certainly be used retrospectively. And I, it is certainly um, it is starting to be used even prospectively for um, early warning systems and can really standardize exposure metrics uh, across urban and rural landscape. So in the United States, 97% um, of our land mass is actually considered rural based on you know, different definitions that you use for rurality. It's approximately about 97, but only about 20% right now, at least, of our population lives in rural areas. And so when you think about exposure metrics and economy of scale, a lot, you'll see a lot of studies tend to be in population dense areas and urban areas because that weather station that's in that urban area is a pretty good measure of what people are experiencing in that very concentrated land mass, right? Only 3% of the land mass. But when you start to get out into rural areas, you're less, obviously, um, there's a lot more error in, in the weather stations that are placed and the people are spread out so much more that it becomes actually um, quite difficult uh, to, to perform um, uh, uh, well-designed uh, uh, studies uh, to look at exposure um, in rural areas. So this is one way to kind of uh, do this um, without increasing the cost associated with doing those studies. So I just want to say thank you. So this, uh, of course, was a, a um, uh, collaborative effort. Um, and uh, you can certainly learn more about um, all the studies that we are doing. Uh, this is our um, kind of um, a website, Enact Alabama, uh, in, in which we've looked at a lot of different environmental health exposures. And in particular, I want to uh, definitely recognize the, the students as well. Um, so uh, Shia Kent, as well as Sue Wong and, and Connor Wu, um, as well as Molly Richardson were an integral part uh, and really did a lot of the bulk of the work um, from, from my end, as well as, um, so Ben Zajic at Johns Hopkins University, he's the climatologist on the team. And he had three students that really um, did a lot of work in this, uh, in this project as well. And of course the funding um, is also important to recognize. So with that, um, I will stop sharing, I think. And all right, thanks so much, Julia. Um, can everyone see my screen now? I think I've got it up. Um, next is um, VCCA Steering Committee, Dr. Bob Kitchen. Bob. Uh, thank you, John. And Julie, that was a fascinating presentation. I really appreciate that. And it certainly drives home the point that we need to be aware of the heat stress that our workers are exposed to uh, and put in place systems to protect them. So what I'll be doing today is describing what's happening legislatively in terms of worker heat protection, both what's been enacted so far and what's being proposed. Uh, next slide, John. Uh, just a couple facts here. You know, heat's been identified as the leading weather-related killer in the United States. 19 of the 20 hottest years on record have occurred since 2001. And the uh, fourth national climate assessment identified outdoor workers as a population that experiences increased climate risk due to a combination of exposure and sensitivity. Next slide. Between 1992 and 2017, 815 United States workers died from heat and almost 70,000 were seriously injured. And it's projected that by the year 2090, again, by the national climate assessment, the cost of lower labor productivity under rising temperatures is estimated to reach $160 billion in lost wages annually. Uh, currently, there are only three states that have legislation to protect workers from heat, and there's no federal legislation. Next slide. Uh, relative to Virginia, uh, some numbers I was able to pull show that for the two years of 2015 and 2016, there were 100 non-fatal injuries and illnesses and six fatalities for workers, which was caused by heat. But there's a disclaimer. Just about anything you see in terms of data for worker-related heat illness, et cetera, 
uh, says the numbers are generally understood to be gross undercounts because many heat-related illnesses and deaths are blamed on natural causes, as well as other aspects of data collection. So these numbers are dependent on the diagnosis that somebody's given in the ER and probably what's on death certificates. And uh, as physicians know complete death certificates, um, oftentimes the immediate cause of the, uh, or the, the basis for the death isn't necessarily accurately documented. And Virginia is definitely getting hotter and having a greater impact. Uh, this isn't related to workers, but it is a data for what happened just last year in July of 2019. Over a thousand Virginians were admitted to emergency departments or urgent care clinics for heat illness compared to 584 in 2018 and 764 in 2017 during the same period. Next slide. Uh, just a couple slides here to show what's happening over time so far. And you see that from 1970 to 2016, there have been five more days per year above 95 degrees in Richmond. Next slide. And <clears throat> this is a chart that actually was comparing what would happen without any emission reductions. Uh, so we'll look at the uh, uh, orange boxes and you'll see that currently it says there are only maybe a couple of days a year above 100 degrees, again in Richmond. By 2050, uh, it's going to be close to 20 days a year, 2075, 30 days a year, and by 2100, over 50 days a year above 100 degrees. So we definitely need to reverse that, but also need to protect our workers. Next slide. This is the OSHA map of outdoor worker heat fatalities, 2008 to 2016. And it probably, again, is an underestimate, not a, is under reporting, but this is an interactive map such that where you see the stars, you can click on that and it will tell you the circumstances behind the workers uh, fatal experience with heat. And there are three for Virginia. Next slide. So it shows us in 2009 in the city of Nathalie, Virginia, which is uh, South Central Virginia. And this was in tobacco farming. Ploy was working in the tobacco field, pruning the leaves, collapsed when he tried to find shade. He died en route to the hospital. In 2010 in Ridgeway, which is a little further west and almost on the North Carolina line, in the roofing and siding field, person was working on the roof, collapsed, uh, ambulance arrived at the scene, he was pronounced dead at the hospital. And in 2013 in Norfolk in shipbuilding, a worker was doing cleanup operations, he collapsed, later died, and the heat index was at 97 degrees. Next slide. So what currently, what legislation is currently in place? Well, here we have three states, California, whose legislation started in, it was enacted in 2006, Washington State, 2008, Minnesota, 2009, and the armed forces have had heat protection regulations in place for years. The Army and the Air Force have a combined regulation, as does the Navy and Marine Corps. Marine Corps. And proposed legislation, there's a federal uh, bill which introduced in the House, H.R. 3668, the Assumption Valdivia Heat Illness and Fatality Prevention Act. And in Virginia this year, we had bills in both the Senate and the House of Delegates, uh, the Employment, Health and Safety Standards Heat Illness Prevention. Next slide. I'm going to talk about the California legislation because it was the first and also it's been the one that's been pretty much the template for most legislation since that uh, because of the range of measures that it um, enacted. And it served as the model for Virginia and also the federal bill. And California came to their legislation when in 2005, they had four workers die of heat related illnesses. So by 2006, they passed this legislation. As we noted before, this was the first worker heat protection passed in the nation. Uh, two years ago, it was renamed the Maria Isabel Vazquez Jimenez Heat Illness Prevention Regulation. Um, and this was 10 years after Ms. Vazquez uh, expired due to extreme heat. And that was in 2008. Now what's important about that is that's two years after California had their regulation passed. What it shows is, and the comment was that despite having the regulation, you need to have 
the ability to inspect and enforce the regulation. So anyway, uh, she was working in uh, grapevines, uh, tying them up. Temperature went above 95 degrees. The water cooler was a 10 minute walk away. People, the workers said the foreman didn't allow them enough time. She collapsed, taken to the hospital. Uh, her body temperature was at 108 degrees. She died two days later. Next slide. And uh, unfortunately, another unfortunate uh, event here relative to the naming of the federal legislation, the Assumption Valdivia Heat Illness and Fatality Prevention Act. And Mr. Valdivia came to the United States in July of 2004 to join his son who had come from Mexico uh, a month or so before that. And his father joined him five days after working 10 hour days picking grapes. On the day it was 105 degrees, he collapsed in the field. The crew boss told his son to drive the father home. Uh, Mr. Valdivia got worse, son turned for the hospital, but he had died. Next slide. So the sponsors of the federal legislation are Representative Chu from California and Representative Grijalva from Arizona. And its purpose is to direct OSHA to issue an occupational safety and health standard to protect workers from heat related injuries and illnesses. Unfortunately, the environment such, is such that this site that analyzes bills, Congress.gov says it only has about a 3% chance of being enacted. So <clears throat> we'll talk more about that. Uh, and what's interesting is just in yesterday's paper, there was uh, Washington Post, there was an article about the House Democrats unveiling their ambitious climate package and it was called Solving the Climate Crisis. It was 587 pages long. On page 298, the section is Protect Workers from Extreme Weather Conditions, and it specifically mentions, mentions this bill, the Asuncion Valdivia Heat Illness and Fatality Prevention Act. So there's still interest in, uh, significant interest in getting that passed. There was, uh, this is the Heat Stress Coalition for this bill, the group of organizations that got together under the, um, I'd say the direction of public citizen. And you can see United Automobile Workers, Farm Workers, Communication Workers. Uh, VCCA actually had an opportunity to participate in this. I'd say more as an, an observer role, but it was very interesting to see this uh, legislation being formulated. Next slide. So now we get into the Virginia uh, worker heat protection. And this was introduced by Delegate Ward from Hampton and Senator Hashmi, uh, and they're known as patrons. In Virginia, when somebody introduces a bill, they're not a sponsor, they're called a patron. And the work group that was behind this legislation, uh, you can see we have, again, public citizen, farm workers, uh, League of Conservation Voters, we had a role in this as well. Uh, put together this legislation and was able to present it to uh, Delegate Ward, who then introduced it. Next slide. What we find is that based on the California legislation and then what's reflected in both the federal and Virginia bills, there are some con common standards uh, and requirements across these bills. And the impacted industries are agriculture, construction, landscaping, oil and gas extraction, and transportation. Next slide. So, the specific areas that these bills concentrate on are provision of water, access to shade, high heat procedures, emergency response procedures, acclimatization, training, heat illness prevention plan. Next slide. Now, I'm not going to read the particular items for each of these, but you can see the specifics that they get into. Example is that, uh, back to provision of water, thanks John. Uh, they talk about how much water employees should get on an hourly basis when they're working in these high heat environments. Okay, next slide. Access to shade. Uh, stipulates that this should be when the temperature exceeds 80 degrees. And I find this fourth point to be particularly interesting. Shall be at least enough to accommodate the number of employees on recovery or rest periods so they can sit in a normal posture fully in the shade without having to be in physical contact with each other. So I don't think handing a five or six employees a golf umbrella is going to do it. Uh, high heat procedures, 
kick in when the temperature exceeds 95 degrees, but for Virginia, it's at 90 degrees. And these are the different points, effective communication, observation for signs and symptoms, um, identifying how to put in place uh, emergency procedures. And they actually spell out how long the rest periods and cool down periods should be. Next slide. And emergency response procedures. Uh, if you go back to the description of the workers who passed away relative to those bills, you'll see that a lot of times the people, the supervisors on site weren't taking specific steps recognizing this person had had a significant uh, event, sending them home uh, with a, a relative, those type of things. But anyway, so this outlines what the worker, uh, work employees have to do. Okay, John. Uh, also, there is a section for acclimatization. Somebody who's new to a high heat area has to be gradually exposed to that. And a specific heat illness prevention plan in writing at the work site in English and the language understood by the majority of the employees and identifies these many measures that are required to protect workers from the heat. Next. And then there's very specific items relative to training, both for the supervisor employees and very specifically what the supervisor is responsible for. Okay, next slide. And the current status for the Virginia legislation, uh, House Bill 805 and Senate Bill 411 were both seen in their respective labor and commerce committees and both were voted to be passed on or continued to 2021. And I put if the patrons so choose in parentheses. Two days ago, the Virginia Heat Stress Coalition work group had a call, had a meeting, and we got caught up on where all this stood. And it, I found from that, that just by virtue of these two committees identifying to pass this on, didn't guarantee that it would automatically be considered when 2021 rolls around. The particular patron, or if there's a new patron, will need to reintroduce it. So we expect that will likely happen, but it's not a, a, a done deal. Uh, what has happened relative to action on this legislation is that, like so many other things, COVID-19 has pretty much taken everybody's time and uh, attention here. So there really hasn't been any additional activity since the end of the General Assembly. And something I wasn't aware of, and looks like it's gonna be a consideration, is that there's a separate regulatory process and they describe this notice of intended regulatory action. And what happens is that particular departments can say that we need to establish regulations relative to a cer certain subject or certain activity. And then they go through a whole different process, a whole many step process in terms of getting these regulations uh, enacted but it's not the same as legislation, it's not statutory. So you have a regulatory and a statutory process. So it's possible that these heat illness protection uh, measures could actually come, uh, could actually occur without there being specific legislation. But what we're not sure is that not all, uh, there's not a permanence to regulatory activity. Whereas with legislation, you have a better guarantee that this is going to be long standing. And so a message that I got from a gentleman who's overseeing this work group is that this is one of the things that we're gonna to need to look into to determine if there's gonna to have to be legislation passed to guarantee that these uh, regulations will stay in place. Uh, so our next steps for this uh, heat stress coalition is to try to keep it on the General Assembly agenda, reach out to Delegate Ward and Senator Hashmi to see if they intend to reintroduce this and that we need to get a significant amount of education for our legislatures. Uh, the bill itself was crafted uh, fairly close to the deadline for submitting legislation, you know, last fall for this year's General Assembly. Typically they want several months to go ahead and reach out to various legislators explaining the basis for the legislation and the importance and didn't really have an opportunity to do that. So that's recognized that that's gonna be important and get district specific data. 
we discussed that if when you're talking to the legislatures, you could actually give them the numbers for their particular uh, district, they would probably have greater uh, influence on the steps that they take. So Julie, I'll be interested to follow up with you when you talk about Alabama reporting, I think county level heat related illness numbers. Uh, I made a number of phone calls uh, through Virginia and so far I haven't been able to find that we have such a system in place. But uh, so that's where we stand with the Virginia legislation. Uh, nothing's gonna happen this year, maybe next year. It's possible that the regulatory process will put these measures in place. But unfortunately, we're not alone because right now only three states have it and there is no federal legislation. So, so thank you. Uh, I put my email down there in case somebody wants to send me any questions later, but uh, Julie and I can go ahead and field your questions now from the Q&A or anything else. Thanks, Bob. Um, I've just got a couple of slides here to share before we open it up for Q&A. Just a reminder that the Q&A box uh, should be in the menu on your screen. But we always want to provide an advocacy action opportunity on these webinars. And here you see our parent organization, the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health's Policy Action Agenda is a comprehensive document that was released last year. Um, so this is a national action that health professionals can take, kind of signing on to um, the agenda for how we effectively uh, protect human health from a changing climate. Um, we're also excited that we are working on a Virginia specific version of this um, as a, as a sign-on letter and, and petition action, which we will uh, release in the coming weeks. Um, so we're, we'll be excited to roll that out and, and we'll look forward to your support and promotion to your networks. I also wanted to mention that um, we are offering through uh, ANOVA's continuing medical education system uh, credits. Um, you can see the website at the bottom of the screen here, icmes.anova.org. Um, everyone who attends, the, uh, everyone who is attending this webinar will receive more detailed instructions uh, tomorrow uh, in a follow-up email for how to claim these credits if you are interested. And with that, I'll just say uh, one quick reminder that our, our next webinar will be August 6th on harmful algae blooms. Um, but we will go ahead and open it up for questions and answers unless Sam, did you want to jump in here? Hello, I just recognized that I was a very remiss, uh, did a very remiss introduction and didn't give the bios of our speakers. So I thought uh, I would just uh, let you all know that Dr. Golke is an assistant professor of environmental health in the Department of Population Health Sciences at Virginia Tech. She graduated with a bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Michigan and completed both a master's degree and doctorate in environmental health from the University of Washington and she joined uh, Virginia Tech in 2015 from the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Public Health, and she's a member of the Society for Toxicology and Teratology Society. And then Dr. Bob Kitchen is a board-certified family uh, physician who retired in Feb April 2018 after 39 years of practice. He had most recently practiced with the Mid-Atlantic Permanent, uh, Permanente Medical Group, providing care for members of Kaiser Permanente in Northern Virginia. And Prior to this, uh, his 24 years of practice with Kaiser, he uh, practiced for 20 years in the Air Force with both stateside and overseas assignments with the last six years being on the faculty of the Family Practice Residency Program at Andrews Air Force Base. He received his MD from Tulane University School of Medicine and his BS from the U US Air Force Academy. And as uh, John mentioned, he is the co-chair of, of advocacy of, at uh, Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action. So, um, yes, I think now we can uh, proceed with the questions. Yeah, Bob and Julia, the first question is, can you extrapolate some of the heat data uh, to the experience of hikers on hot days? Julia, you want to take that? Uh, sure, yes. Um, I, I think certainly just from a, you know, um, a metabolic heat generation and uh, temperature exposure, you can certainly extrapolate. I, I will say that one thing that is important to understand about um, occupational exposure is uh, that there is this um, acclimatization that, that happens. And so a lot, of the, a lot of the stuff that you read about hikers, for example, 
um, are people that come from, say, for example, Virginia and go out to hike the Grand Canyon without acclimatizing, without really understanding that they need to do that, um, and then run into a lot of issues there. Hopefully, um, if procedures are being followed correctly, that is not necessarily happening in an occupational setting, such that um, workers uh, are given the opportunity to acclimate uh, to, to the heat that they're experiencing um, uh, and, and gradually build up. So essentially, physiologically, what's happening is you know, your blood volume is increasing, um, your sweat efficiency is increasing um, as you progressively expose yourself to more and more heat. Great. The next question recognizes or, or appreciates um, the fact that uh, this focused on uh, rural areas in, in part when so much of the data and studies that we see comes from uh, urban areas without uh, proper application. So that's great. And very related to rural areas, um, there's a question on the emergency department admissions related to workers on the pipeline, if either of you have any information on that. But if uh, you're referring to the numbers that I put up there for what happened in two, uh, July of last year pre compared to previous years, that was all admissions in um, Virginia ER. So it wasn't just for workers. Uh, and I don't know of any data that would have pulled workers themselves out of that or even as more specific in terms of pipeline. Um, so yeah, that was just Virginians in general, if you're referring to that uh, period in July of last year. <clears throat> okay, um, one clarification um, on terminology, the difference uh, in heat stroke and heat exhaustion. If either of you have the definitions handy for those different terms. I always find this challenging to remember this, so I just looked it up for you. <laughs> heat exhaustion includes slow heartbeat, clamminess, heavy sweating, and a desire for water. Heat stroke, on the other hand, includes fast heartbeat, decreased urination, decreased sweating. So you're sicker with heat stroke. It's more advanced. Great. And a question for Bob is, does it make sense to contact state legislators now about heat legislation or to wait until after the election? Um, certainly the earlier we can get around to that, the better. We're going to have to find out as this work group reaches out, uh, what will be the status for this legislation? Will it even be introduced next year? So they have to again have a patron who wants to have that legislation presented to the General Assembly. We're assuming that'll be the case and probably Delegate Ward and Senator Hashmi. Uh, once that's been confirmed, uh, then yes, it'd be time to start reaching out. And that goes back to what I was saying about having some very specific data. That'd be part of our conversation with the state legislature. So if now means tomorrow, uh, not yet, but uh, the sooner the better, the sooner we get the education out there. Because as anybody who's worked with the legislature knows, uh, before knows that uh, sometime, typically September or so is when you want the legisl legislation created for your delegates to then work on and consider introducing. So we only have a couple of months here. Great. And um, one last question in uh, for Dr. Golke. Um, do you see a role for personal monitors in preventing heat illness in workers? Yeah, I think it absolutely can be uh, used. Um, the fact, um, unfortunately, the fact is, is that, you know, in a lot of uh, places that, it, that certainly have risk, nothing is used. Um, so we talk about, you know, legislation, it's really important to, and, uh, you know, I really appreciate the um, Bob's presentation on this. Um, not only legislation, but then enforcement and implementation afterwards. So uh, government workers, so the Public Works, uh, City of Birmingham Public Works, doesn't necessarily need to follow OSHA regulations. Um, and a lot of times, you know, you'll see kind of workarounds, a lot of the examples, um, and Bob mentioned, so in California and a lot of agriculture, it's the way that um, uh, the um, people are paid is a piece rated uh, situation. So, you know, per number of bushels of, of apples. So even if you have in place water and rest periods, if the culture and, and if the, um, you know, if, if the payment is based on the number of things you're 
you're doing, then there is obviously a very clear incentive for the worker to kind of disregard that they need rest, they need water. And so, you know, dealing with that is ex extremely um, important. And, and one way is potentially personal monitoring, again, uh, that could create a culture. Certainly I've seen that. Um, I've seen some studies actually out of California that um, have started to do that so that even, you know, workers will get essentially an alert um, based on their heart rate as well as uh, the, the ambient temperature that they need to kind of, you know, think about resting now. I think that that is, you know, a fantastic uh, way, way to do things. Yeah, I was going to add to that. Um, if you look at these regulations in terms of um, what's required, it makes statements about encourage frequent drinking of water. And you go, that's kind of a no-brainer. But uh, going back to my previous military experience, I remember hearing that the Israeli army required their commanders to make sure the troops drank so much water on a particular schedule because it was recognized that by the time you're getting thirsty, you're already behind the curve, you're already dehydrated. And Julia mentioned the uh, goals for production in the field. When you go back to the Asuncion Valdivia case, his son commented that when he first went there, preceding his father, he couldn't keep up. They were required to uh, fill so many baskets, like 15 baskets within a certain period of time of grapes. And he was in danger of getting fired because he's only doing seven baskets at first. It was so hard for him to function in this heat. So those are deterrents to taking time out to go get that water or getting out of the shade. So it requires a lot of, um, supervision, monitoring, emphasis to make sure these are applied. But again, unfortunately, we only have it in three states. Great, thanks, Bob. And I'll combine these last two questions to wrap us up. And any further questions, um, you can feel free to submit them to info at virginiaclinicians.org and we'll make sure that we get the, message, uh, the um, answers to you. I should also point out that this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website uh, next week at some point. But the last two questions that I think are, are good that came in um, are, um, I won't pronounce, try to pronounce the drug name, um, but are there any medications that are used to regulate the body temperature um, as the workforce gets older? And the second question that came in um, that would be great to address is given COVID-19 concerns and social distancing, um, you know, what is the status of a lot of the cooling centers that are relied upon um, public cooling centers for the homeless or for libraries, the mall, places like that that might be closed in this environment that um, folks who need them might not be able to access them. Is, are there any alternates being discussed or solutions there? I'll say on the first one about, I'm seeing, I'm looking at the listing of the questions, the one about cooling centers. I did not come across anything relative to that, so I, I'm not able to comment on that. Uh, the second one, absolutely. Uh, medications which interfere with the body's ability to manage heat can be a significant factor. And that was supposed to be one of the things, if you look at one of the pieces of legislation, I don't remember if it's in all of them or just one of the states, they specifically mentioned medications that the patient, uh, the worker is taking, but that needs to be taken in consideration. And on the cooling centers question, um, this is a, a great question. And um, actually CDC does have guidance now and Arizona has implemented it. So in, in terms of how to open uh, a cooling center during uh, a pandemic, and, and really it's um, uh, what they've implemented in Arizona is essentially opening cooling centers in, for example, libraries, but then taking temperatures uh, and um, uh, kind of you know, monitoring the situation in that way. Now, um, are people less likely to go to cooling centers during a pandemic? I would say yes. Um, so there's a lot of you know, kind of concern and work related n right now about you know, um, the COVID mitigation strategies, how that might increase heat-related illnesses. And uh, um, an international uh, group actually has put together a, um, a kind of uh, question and answer uh, about, that, about this particular issue. And I can certainly um, provide that. Um, it's uh, the Global Heat Health um, International Network, so G-H-H-I-N. Um, but I can actually put it in the chat box too, um, if you're interested in more, more information.
Great. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for attending and for Bob and Julia for really uh, great presentations. Uh, just one note again, our next um, webinar is scheduled for August 6th. But we thank you for attending um, and uh, look out for the follow-up email tomorrow with the CME uh, credit claim information. But thanks, everyone, and we'll end here for the day. Have a great long weekend. Happy 4th. Thank you.